All right, hello. I see everyone's filtering in. My name is Morgan, an event coordinator with Politics and Pros, and I'd like to welcome you all to PNP Live. Everyone in attendance tonight has purchased a signed copy of Hero of Two Worlds, the Marquis de Lafayette in the Age of Revolution, and the book will officially be uh, ready for sale Tuesday, August 24th. That's the official publication date. So that is when you all's book will be ready for pickup. And that is when it will start to ship from our store. Soon, I will also drop a link in the chat for where you can purchase an extra unsigned copy of the book straight from our website. You can ask our speakers a question tonight by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And we'll try to get to as many of those questions as we can toward the end of the program, but we apologize in advance if we don't have time to address your question. Also, there are auto captions for this event by hitting the live caption button at the bottom of your screen. Let's introduce tonight's guests. Mike Duncan is one of the most popular history podcasters in the world and the author of the New York Times bestselling book, The Storm Before the Storm. His award-winning series, The History of Rome, remains a legendary landmark in the history of podcasting. Duncan's ongoing series, Revolutions, explores the great political revolutions that have driven the course of modern history. Duncan will be in conversation tonight with Jamel Bowie, a columnist for the New York Times and political analyst for CBS News. He covers campaigns, elections, national affairs, and culture. Previously, Jamel was chief political correspondent for Slate Magazine and a staff writer at the Daily Beast. He also held fellowships at the American Prospect and the Nation Magazine. So let's give our guests a virtual round of applause. Uh, thank you for the virtual round of applause. I guess we'll I, just soak that silence in. And... Yeah, we'll just take that in. I still <laughs> yeah. have, I'm still working on getting used to that. I haven't quite figured out how yeah. to respond to it. Um, <laughs> Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, this evening. Uh, thank you, Mike, for the book. Thank you, Politics and Prose, for hosting this. I'm really excited to have this conversation um, because I am a, a longtime listener, and I guess this now makes me a first-time caller, uh, and had a really great time um, with the book, have had a great time with your, your two podcasts, um, and I think there's a lot to discuss in this book. So just to start uh, right off the bat, uh, could you, no, how do I, how do I phrase this? So listeners of the Revolutions podcast will, will know that this book is more or less, uh, more or less takes place along the timeline of the American Revolution, the French Revolution, then at the end, the July Revolution. Um, and so my, my first question for you is, in researching those revolutions for your podcast, did you did you eventually just come to Lafayette as a natural subject for a book, um, as a, as a natural as a character, just sort of ready right there for for exploration? Yeah, <clears throat> the thing that got me really moving from Lafayette is just somebody who shows up in the show. There are many famous historical pig figures who show up in the show to somebody that I sort of latched on to was after I got done with the French Revolution. Now, for the first thing that piqued my curiosity about him was when you when I'm going through the American Revolution series, you talk about Lafayette and it's all very laudatory. It's all very like he's this great guy. We love him. He's this kind of like puppy dog who hung out with George Washington. And that's all great. And then I moved over to the French Revolution and all of French revolutionary historiography about Lafayette is kind of like, oh, he's, he's a clumsy dunce and he didn't do anything right. And he just kind of got evicted from the revolution. And so there, <laughs> there was something about like that, those two completely different versions of the same guy that really piqued my curiosity. And I was like, okay, th this is actually really, really interesting, this guy. But, you know, for as much as I knew about him at that point, was that he was a participant in the American Revolution, a participant in the French Revolution, and then kind of retired to his farm and came back and, made, and did this one sort of grand tour through the United States in 1824 and 1825. But there wasn't much to his story beyond that. 
And then I kept going through the show and I find him showing up in correspondence with Simone Bolivar. I find him showing up uh, adjacent to the recognition of free and independent Haiti after the Haitian revolution, because he was a big advocate for that. He wanted France to have normal relations with free Haiti. Um, and then I moved into the revolution of 1830 and he's now, you know, he's pushing into his sixties and seventies He's participating in these underground carbonari conspiracies to overthrow Louis the 18th in the early 1820s. And then he's right in the thick of the revolution of 1830. I mean, he's, he's a major player in the revolution of 1830. And then even after that, when he gets sort of disenchanted with it, uh, you know, there's revolts in 1832 that he's, you know, are happening like right at his feet. So it, it, it moved very quickly from like this guy who I sort of considered to be a teenager and somebody who by basically would flamed out by his late twenties is actually a major player in tons of events that covered this really important period that we call, you know, like the age of democratic revolution between 1775 and like 1830. Um, and so right as I was wrapping up the revolution of 1830, I was, I was like, okay, I want, I want to do sort of a good retrospective of Lafayette when he dies in 1834. I'm like, I, I really got to come back and do kind of a standalone episode just to like recap this guy who was just around for everything. And that recap really became the basis of the book proposal. And I just kind of changed that into, I just really want to write a whole complete biography of this guy's life um, and get it, get it out there into the world. You know, the, you, you're recounting that makes me think that there, there's, there are points at the book, especially later in his life when he already is, just sort of, he is already the hero of two worlds. He is famous in America. He is attracting guests, you know, people come to Paris to see him. Um, and, and when he's doing his tour in the United States in 1824, there are parts where I think I made margins in the notes that were kind of almost Forrest Gumpy, where sort of like he meets the young, some young, a young artist, a young person who will become a famous artist. Right. Meets someone who becomes a famous politician. Yep. Like they, they remember meeting Lafayette. It becomes like the, the whole kind of thing, which I thought um, was a lot of fun and gets to something that's a lot of fun about the book, which is that for, I think as much as it is a very serious biography, it is, it's a fun read. Um, Lafayette had this very dynamic life um, from start to finish uh, that, that may makes for something really compelling. Um, I think. And so I wanted to ask, ask you, uh, on that point, sort of, was there, was there, is there any, is there any sort of part of Lafayette's like, like which Lafayette, uh, do you find sort of most personally appealing, most personally compelling, most personally interesting? I think for me, it is the Lafayette of after the uh, the French Revolution of 1789, um, when he is sort of on the outs with the Jacobin revolutionaries and sort of the more radical edges of the revolution. And he's kind of trying to uh, maneuver through all of this. But I'd be curious to know, um, if there's any portion of him that to you is is particularly interesting well i mean i did i did kind of just say this i am i am a big fan of sort of later lafayette you know like paunchier lafayette with with a hair piece and a and a coat um you know and a limp that he you know he, and he would kind of he would kind of play up his limp uh because he was you know this old revolutionary hero but he got the limp because he slipped on a patch of ice when he was like you know 58 years old and and broke his leg um i i really like later lafayette um i think he's really really interesting as this living symbol of of what had already by the end of his life become like a bygone age i mean so many of the people who were involved in the American revolution and the French revolution, like they don't make it <laughs> through yeah, yeah. the French revolution. And even most of the people who he was involved in the, in the American revolution with are dying off. And so because he was, because he got started at such a young age, because he was like 19 years old when he gets going, you know, by the time he's 75, he's outlived most of his contemporaries. There's a few who are still kicking around, you know, Talleyrand was still kicking around. Um, but there were all these people who were growing up in, you know, who, who were born in 1800 or 1805 or 1810, who themselves were then coming of age. And they're looking at this, uh, you know, somebody like Lafayette, who was this connection to the French Revolution, which by the time he's an old man, has already become this sort of like mythical event that uh, that none of them actually participated in, none of them actually lived in. 
Um, so, so all of that sort of later Lafayette, I find very interesting and also very undercovered. And like I said, it's one of the big impetuses, like for why I wrote the book was because most biographies that you read of him sort of get him out of the French revolution and then do a couple of wrap up chapters. And what I wanted to do was get him out of the French revolution and then have still a whole third of a book left to tell that story. I've, you know, as you, as you say that, I've been trying, I was thinking and trying to think of if there are any other comparable figures in American history who have that sort of, have, have both that longevity um, and also still are very active in, in political life towards in their lives. And I really can't think of anyone off the top of my head, which kind of gets to what makes Lafayette so unique. Um, he never seems to get to a point where he's sort of a grumpy old man right where someone who is disdainful of younger revolutionaries who thinks no. that they he could do it all that his generation did it better he always seems in your in your in your account of him he seems quite open um up to the very end to maybe not new ideas but at least like new personalities new people new approaches to old problems and i i found that very something to admire first of all that's i think a very rare thing um to find in history but also just um just interesting in its own right and and he him and yeah i mean there there are good there are great quotes from in the book that i came across uh especially from the early 1820s um where he's taught it could be now when he is this sort of revered elder statesman where he's saying you know most most people my age will talk about the youth as if they are, you know, horrible, they're lazy, they're, you know, they're, they're not like we were when we were young, when we were virtuous and noble and we did everything right. And all they do is, is like kind of lays around. Um, he was, yeah, he was very complimentary of young. He said, you know, the, the students today, um, he, he preferred hanging out with them because they grew up after the revolution because they didn't, and they were not then burdened with a lot of the prejudices uh, that, people who were born before the revolution like him were often saddled with. And then he also like, he never stopped um, participating in things. He never stopped trying to reform things. He, he always, you know, he is, he's a revolutionary because he's constantly involved in revolutions, but really at heart, fundamentally, he was a reformer. He always wanted to see what was going on and then make it a little bit better, see what was going on and then make it a little bit better. And he didn't have a vision of things that then once you achieve that vision, you sort of stop here and don't keep moving. He always did want to keep moving. And by 18, you know, when he's uh, sort of succumbing to his final illness in 1834, when he gets he gets this bad cold and he's, you know, his final letters are him griping about how he can't make it down to the chamber of delegates to give some speeches that he wants to give because he's got this chest cold. And that's like the last the last letter in his uh, in his collected correspondence, because even like on his deathbed, he just assumed he was going to. Uh, get better and then go back to work that that gets to something that i was thinking about the entire time i was reading the book which is that lafayette's revolutionary he is a revolutionary for sort of the, the classical liberal values you know constitutionalism um freedom of the press uh freedom of speech um many things that we take take for granted now he he was an advocate for them when they were very much still radical ideas and the one thing I, 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 I sort of wonder, um, especially given how he at, at points was ahead of the curve in terms of his peers, but then very much behind the curve when the French Revolution especially starts picking up, um, is like, did, did Lafayette have a vision of society beyond basically i would not, not say basically that's that's unfair beyond this um beyond political liberalism did he have a sense for the social questions and and i wonder if part of why he got overtaken by events and by the speed of things with the french revolution was that that aspect of things sort of of uh of uh economic equality of um sort of standing against entrenched hierarchies beyond the aristocracy if he could didn't quite have a handle on that stuff yeah it would i mean it would have been interesting if he had if if we had shifted him you know 10 or 15 years further because he's you know he's approaching the end of his life just as what we would now consider sort of like modern european socialism is starting to get going and saint simon was writing 
um, was, be, he was, you know, like a precursor to, um, you know, a pre, uh, one of the utopian socialists that then the Marxists are going to be sort of acting against a generation hence. And there, I mean, there's stuff from Lafayette where he's not down with Saint-Simon. He was uh, far more interested in, uh, you know, liberal economics, Riccardi and uh, John Stuart Mill and people like that. So w- w- where would he have gone mentally? I don't, I, you know, I think it's a hard question to answer. I do think that he had a conception of reform and a conception of revolution where a revolution, you're you're basically, you're allowed to go into revolution against the existing state. If there's not a constitution, if there's not some kind of participatory legislature, if there is not a guaranteed bill of rights of some kind of that the government basically can't encroach on liberties according to this list of things, but that once that has been enacted, then it's no longer permissible to go into revolution. Then you have to direct all of your reform efforts and all of the things that you want to change about society. You have to direct it through the legislature. You can't do it while violating other people's fundamental civil liberties. Um, and you're bound to respect the laws as they are handed down by that body. And so that that was sort of the, the things that were in his head. So, you know, Lafayette is almost alone like this is the thing that actually sets him apart from like everybody in the french revolution is when the constitution of 1791 is finally enacted after like after the national assembly spends two years with this by by the fall of 1791 like everybody's mad at the king the king is mad at everybody else nobody's really happy with this compromise thing called the constitution of 1791 and lafayette is like hey we did it we have a constitution now everybody's bound to um everybody's bound to follow this constitution which most people didn't want to do Royalists didn't want to do it. Republicans didn't want to do it. Radicals didn't want to do it. But he thought that now that a constitution was in place, whatever it was, that everybody was duty bound to follow it. And that's where he runs afoul. I think that even under a constitutional system, Lafayette is not somebody like like a Francois Guizot who then doesn't want to move any further. He, you know, by 18, uh, he's always going to be in the quote unquote party of movement that wants to look around and see what else needs to be done, but it has to be done in a constitutional way. And what, what runs him into trouble with the Jacobins is that they were continuing to want to sort of go over the top of the constitution because they didn't like it. They didn't agree with it. And frankly, nobody else did either. Lafayette was, he was like him and like four other dudes in all of France who thought the constitution of 1791 was good. So that, that aspect of his personality, I think um, it, it's sort of it's interesting to think of in the context of the United States and American slavery, of which he was a critic, right? He was a mm-hmm. he was a strong critic of American slavery. You make note throughout the book of how he was constantly urging George Washington to free his slaves. Um, I thought it was uh, the the parts about the his tour across the country where he is like, you know, very very uh, uh, openly and um, sort of in people's faces, like meeting with African-Americans, um, sort of talking about how slavery is abolished. Uh, I like to imagine sort of kind of like slightly awkward conversations with Madison and Jefferson about all this stuff. Um, but it doesn't seem to me that Lafayette would have endorsed like a rebellion of the enslaved in the United States, precisely because Americans have a constitution. They have a um they have sort of political outlets and there's a reformist way to get to that outcome um yeah and i mean to that like when i was talking about there's a whole section in the book where i'm sort of go through what you know he introduced the declaration he was the first one to introduce sort of a a first draft of what becomes the declaration of the rights of man and of the citizen um just before the fall of the bastille in july of 1789 and and i went through his list sort of point by point, because that really represents what his political philosophy was like it's and he would actually say this, like, if you want to know what I think it's all there in the Declaration of the Rights of Man. Um, And one of the points in there that he wrote in there was the right of insurrection. And he believed that if you, if a constitution was not like I just said, if a constitution wasn't in place, if there wasn't a declaration of rights, then you were allowed to go into insurrection. But he's also making these points like, well, we need a representative legislature. Like what counts as a representative legislature, right. Lafayette? Like, are women allowed to go into revolt because they are not at like in any way, shape, or form represented by this government? Are slaves in the United States, do they have a right to go into revolt? And if you follow his logic in the Declaration of Rights of Man, he's 
endorsing slave insurrections and saying right. that would absolutely be permissible. And I think that if he really thought about it, he would recognize that they do have that right. But at the same time, he believe and in his own sort of way he's he's got he's so mixed up about the united states in so many different ways because he does believe them to be the beacon of liberty and he does believe that they're the first to have a constitutional government and that it and that emancipation needs to basically go through the white legislature and that it can't happen because of a slave revolt um but when for example we're talking about haiti um you know i it, it he's he does not comment very much on the insurrections in Saint-Domingue because he's obviously he's caught up in what's happening in Paris and then he's stuck in an Austrian prison for five years he wasn't he was not getting much news um but after Haiti becomes free but it's actually it's sort of there's a kingdom and a republic that's going on um you know he endorses France recognizing their independence and recognizing them as a sovereign nation so ultimately he's not saying these guys went into revolt and they shouldn't have and we should reclaim that colony um but yeah, he's certainly not telling people that he meets in Mississippi and Alabama, hey, guess what? You know, I think you should rise up and I think you would have every right to do it. Even though if you follow his logic, they absolutely do. Right. It, it, it's the fact that the logic very clearly goes to this place, but that he either doesn't see it or can't kind of bring himself to to put himself along the, the logical uh, conclusion there. To me, it speaks to how much he is still very much a person of his particular social upbringing, his particular social class, right? That like mm -hmm. he is born into rigid hierarchies. And although he wants to um, abolish the, the, the political consequence of those hierarchies, he wants there to be a more open society. I, it seems to me that he basically does internalize a hierarchical view of the world um, such that a situation like, you know, the United States having uh, vast parts of the United States being slave territory, such that women have no real political rights, are things that don't like necessarily upset him on this fundamental level. Right, and I would say that that's broadly true. Um, you know, he he did believe that everybody was born free and equal in rights, and he explicitly included. Um, all Africans that he encountered sort of anywhere, either in France or in the new world, like he, but as you say, um, he's not willing to over, he, he never overthrows any government or enters into any revolutionary system on behalf of those people, right? He, it, he does enter revolutionary um, activity on his own behalf or on behalf of people that are like him. Uh, but he, yeah, does not actively extend that to sort of the people that you would expect if you're if you're going to truly throw off your own mental apparatus and really come into this as like, no, I am a radical egalitarian. Um, he never he. Yeah, it's true. He never gets there. He's he's absolutely from a very young age because he grew up in the center of Versailles. And I, I think that there's this thing that happened to him where he he grew up in the center of Versailles, which is like the 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 inner circle nobility of one of like, and you, you can include the entire earth in this, right? Um, the, you know, the inner circle of one of the richest and most powerful nobilities uh, and in the whole world. And then he goes over to the United States and he's encountering people like Alexander Hamilton and Henry Knox um, and Benedict Arnold before Benedict Arnold goes rogue. You, you're talking about these people who were just sort of came up from quote unquote nothing and were clearly smart, intelligent, capable people who in in back in France would not have been allowed to attain the uh, the levels of power and influence that they were able to attain in the United States. And he's like, he's looking at these people that he hung out with in Versailles. And he's like, but a lot of you people are idiots. Like, I don't think <laughs> that, I don't think that there is something about the genetic blood of aristocracy that like makes you better than other people. And even though I am a noble, I don't think that my noble blood is what makes me better than other people. Um, but that does not take him to a place of like, like I said, like radical egalitarianism. It takes him to a place where he believes in the meritocracy that you right. know, that's not even not not really a term that existed at the time. But we can put it back on that, that that everybody job should be open to merit. The leaders of the country should be able to come from anywhere. Um, and he wants to be recognized for the things that he did not who he was and he wanted that for everybody he if if you did great things you should be able to become a great person you shouldn't just be born and say well i was born into this and so i'm great um 
but yeah, he, he, most of his sort of, um, reformist tendencies and his, uh, his, what you would call like his, uh, his social reform agenda, most of it comes from kind of a paternalistic place where like, I am the rich philanthropic benefactor of the poor. I'm the rich philanthropic benefactor of, you know, I'm uh, of slaves. I'm the rich philanthropic benefactor of this or that cause, but it's always sort of in that I'm the rich philanthropic benefactor of, of all mankind, as opposed to, you know, like, I guess maybe like empowering those people to do it for themselves. Yeah. I mean, and, and the, the, I mean, that I think, and I, I said this to you, but we were just talking about this in the lead up to this, that that to me speaks to sort of like the limits of the kind of, um, the kind of liberalism that Lafayette embodies, the limits of that sort of stage of revolutionary reform. But on the flip side, as we were saying earlier, it's not clear that if, you know, if he were encounter, if you were, if he did encounter, um, if he had lived 10 more years and encountered, uh, from the bottom up movements for liberation. It's not clear to me that he would have rejected them. He seems like a guy who would have been like, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, he, which, no, go ahead. Go ahead. No. And just, he, he, you know, he had, he had these ideas about my, my thing about him is that he represented something that is, and always will remain like a vital component of society, right? Like, he, he's somebody who was coming out of Ancien Regime France, out of sort of the like late medieval conceptions of like aristocracy and royalty and absolutism, uh, where, you know, civil rights literally didn't exist. National sovereignty literally didn't exist. Self-determination didn't exist. Uh, you know, aside from a couple of places, there wasn't really anything like voting legislatures that where people were participating in the crafting of their own laws. Um, these become the things that are stuck in his head which are going to be the things that are going uh, that are necessary for him to fight for, which I believe all of that stuff is going to have to remain in place forever. Like even when you get to the social question, if you move to the social question and you start leaving behind things like civil rights, then you're going, in my opinion, in the wrong direction. And Lafayette would have said, no, you're going in the wrong direction. You absolutely have to have a bill of rights in place. Um, so I, when I look at sort of the grand sweep of history, is d does Lafayette take us to a place of like pure justice and post-revolutionary, you know, a post-revolutionary place where everybody uh, is is happy and free and taken care of? Like, no, his I don't think his program gets us there, but his program was a necessary program that it that did take like fifty years of hard fighting to even get that limited program in place so that then the next generation could come along take a lot of that stuff for granted and then move on to the next thing i mean that's that to me is so striking sort of like my my sort of instinct to want to critique brings me to the you know lafayette was not going to go far enough but it is it is simply the case right that, that those sorts of basic that that basic political liberalism even today is still somewhat contested like these are still recurring fights that we fight about the scope of political freedom the scope of uh uh you know political egalitarianism um and so on and so forth so it it's it it becomes like it, it the, one one of my takeaways from the book is sort of like a, a deeper appreciation for the amount of struggle involved in even achieving those mm -hmm. those basic rights um, that basic paradigm. Uh, that wasn't a question. That's just me monologuing a little bit. Uh, so one thing I wanted to ask you about uh, is that today, very fortuitously, the New Republic published a great piece by David Cleon about your work, about the, the Revolutions podcast, about the history of Rome, and about uh, Hero of Two Worlds. Um, and David makes the point in his piece that uh, in your work, you you neither take sort of a purely structural view of what produces revolutions, but you certainly you, you certainly don't have a a great man view of things. Um, so could you could you say what? And in using Lafayette as an example, because I think Lafayette is kind of an example of this. Um, how do you view people like him in the context of a revolution? Like the the these active figures, they're not they're obviously not driving. Um, 
I was about to say driving the ship, but that doesn't work at all. They're not, they're not. Steer, you steer a ship. You, yeah, you steer. I, I'm steer a Navy, Brett. I should know that. Um, you steer a ship. <laughs> yep, you steer they're a ship. not steering the ship, but they're also not completely at the at the mercy of the of the tides. Yeah, I, I don't think that, you know, that piece, um, you know, opened with him talking about like Tolstoy, uh, all the stuff in Tolstoy at the end of War and Peace, which if you haven't read War and Peace, um, I'm probably one of the 12 people on earth who was like, yeah, War and Peace was a really good book. Now the end of it, like all of his just like ramblings about history is like, that's the best part of it. I've, I've read oh, yeah, that I was a about to times. say, I, oh. I remember when I, when I was assigned this in college, my professor said, it was like, you know, some of you are really going to like the end. And I was like, what are you talking about? And I got you. And I'm like, this is, this should be, the oh, whole it's, book. The be- it's the best part of the whole book, <laughs> man. I've, I've been, and I almost, you know, I, I couldn't quite do it. There's, there's an unfinished draft of a chapter where I'm trying to, when I'm, when I'm, uh, uh, trying to get through the Napoleonic Wars. I was trying to let Tolstoy do the story of like the movement of peoples from west to east and the movement of peoples from from uh, from east to west. Uh, and I just couldn't quite make it work uh, like on a literary level. But, you know, so he's talking about uh, what Tolstoy says about, you know, that it's just these great forces and individuals don't matter. And then he referenced uh, the foundation by Isaac Asimov, which we're all looking forward now to the TV show, uh, which will come out here pretty soon. And then um, and then Marx's quote from 18 Brumaire which is like men do not make their own history but you know they but they exist on a they basically they exist on a stage that has already been set and then they run around and do things and that's roughly where i stand right like like that comment in 18 Brumaire is is pretty much where i'm at because i don't believe that just structure is what makes things happen because ultimately history is the study of people and people doing things and it requires individuals what you know you're an individual and i'm an individual and we are caught up in larger forces but we also make decisions we make choices um when presidents or generals or kings or people like you know just a high placed figure like lafayette when you make decisions that does have an impact on the the larger course of events um and so i've always like through all of revolutions i have always wanted to talk about the choices that people were making when they were confronted with some, uh, you know, some turning point, right? You can, we can go left or we can go right. And really any, any turning point has about five or six different ways that it could go. I think that contingency does play a large role um, in history. And, and Lafayette is somebody who, the thing that I think is so interesting about him is as you get to like, he's not like a Napoleon, Right. And he's not even a George Washington. He's he doesn't even quite get to that level, but he is in there. He is influencing events and he is also being carried along by events. And it does become this feedback loop um, that I think that that is what generates history. And if we get too far into thinking, oh, it's just a, a structural development of economics. Well, who's structurally developing the economics like who's inventing the steam engine like who's thinking up how to organize a factory these factories don't just organize themselves um you know like uh we, we're we're going through a technological revolution right now that the, the, the technological revolution that we're living through you know skynet hasn't gone online yet at least that we know of um <laughs> skynet has not gone online it's not self-generating itself it's people in rooms making choices about what they want to do and how they want to do it Um, so I would never want to get to a point where as much, I mean, as much as I love reading Tolstoy, um, that individual choice doesn't matter and doesn't have a profound effect on how history actually works. Yeah. My, you know, my, um, the area of like American history I know best is sort of the civil war reconstruction period. And this, this rings especially true to me, just in the person of Abraham Lincoln, where I think you can make a good case that the civil war is more or less set into stone by a variety of choices made in the 1830s and 40s and 50s. But there's no particular guarantee that this one guy who happens to be unusually open, who who happens to be both an ardent unionist and unusually open to taking drastic steps to protect the union ends up in this one position. And then there's no real guarantee. There's nothing that, you know, that requires this guy to, to make the very specific and highly idiosyncratic choices he ends up making over the next five years. And so it's sort of like, I I see Lincoln as sort of this great example of a figure who is, whose individual choices really do matter quite a, quite a bit. And it really does matter that this one particular guy happens to be the president 
at this one time and happens to be surrounded by people like William Seward um, and Frederick Douglass. Like all these personalities really do matter, even as you can kind of see from the 30,000 foot view, right? There are these, there are specific material and social forces producing the stage in which they're all they're all they're all doing their thing. Yeah, that they're all yeah, that they're all playing around on. I think that that is exactly right. You know, like great people that great in the sense of like they they have a profound amount of power at their disposal. Like and that's what makes Napoleon, for example, a great man because he had so much power at his disposal. Like hit like Tolstoy's argument is that like somebody like Napoleon would have been churned up no matter what and then would have done basically the same things. And like I don't necessarily think that that's true. Um I, I don't, th- <laughs> I'm sorry, don't, I, I just don't think that that's necessarily true. Um, and that, and that, yeah, and that, uh, you know, as we go through life, um, you know, the choices that are being made right now, you know, like not to drag in like current events, but like if there was a different president in place right now, when it comes to Afghanistan or when it comes to, you know, COVID, like the responses that individual leaders make to these things do matter quite a bit in even how immediate current events unfold. And then that current events just become history. And so right. if if people are going to choose to do different things at different times because of who they were, um, you know, if you if we go back to the 2000 election, like since we're all reflecting now on like Afghanistan, you know, if you go back to the 2000 election, if Al Gore is president instead of George W. Bush, does the course of American history over the past 20 years look the same? I don't think it does. I think it actually could look quite different. Right. And I think one thing I think that your that your your book emphasizes that this isn't just true at the level of sort of the great men. It's true all the way down that personality is, as you said, like Lafayette, someone who isn't a Washington, but is still someone very influential. Um, those personalities matter, too. And the choices they make matter, too. And the great men are, in fact, acting in 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 a feedback loop with the people below them. And so Another way to think of the the 2000 counterfactuals, let's say George Bush did get did get elected, but Dick Cheney wasn't vice president. Like, Mm -hmm. let's say that the vice president was someone else. Right? there's a whole network of people who may not have been at the White in the White House at key moments to make key decisions to produce certain outcomes. And Um, and and then if you you bring it back to the French Revolution, like there's this there's this thing in the book. And I I really I really I, I locked into this even more. Uh, you know, I, I sort of I, I observed this the first time I went through the revolu- French Revolution for the show, and then really locked into it with uh, w- writing the book. Is that when the National Assembly comes up with this notion of active citizen and passive citizens, where they really want to lock in this notion that you have to have a certain amount of money to be able to participate in politics, they they hand this down on like the people of France and the people of Paris after the people of Paris have more or less made the revolution, right? Like the fall of the Bastille and the Women's March on Versailles are the things that make what all of these liberals um, are, have been have been seeking for, for many, many years. Like they finally now get their sort of like wish list of stuff because of what the people on the street did. And when they hand down, you know, this distinction between active citizens and passive citizens, all these people in Paris are like, well, what are you talking about? Like, why can't I participate? Why, why are you writing me out of this? They were, they, were not the, they were not just some like mindless mob charging around um, making trouble just for the sake of making trouble. They, they were able to read the newspaper and they were able to make their own choices. And so they could see, look, these guys are trying to write us out of a process that without us, they would not have even been able to have what it is that they're doing right now. So those choices matter too. The, the people and the mob is, it's a thing, but it's mostly a collection of individuals making their own decisions, which I think also matters a great deal. One last thing I wanted to ask you before we got the questions um, it's just about Lafayette's place in the historical memory. Here in the United States, he, I think he still remains kind of just the hero of the American Revolution. Yeah. So they said that anyone, they said anyone has any reason to know the name, it's for it's for that. Um, I can't even recall when I first learned the name. It was probably like an elementary school and sort of a unit on the American Revolution. Because that is how people know Lafayette. The Hamilton musical, which you alluded to um, earlier, is probably has probably sort of supercharged that that's how people mm-hmm. people know him um but i i have no sense of what his what the memory of lafayette's like in france now i was wondering if you had any sense of that of how the french people relate to lafayette oh sure yeah sure i mean i got to live there for three years and you know when um uh when when i talk about lafayette in the united states or to americans it's usually either like who like was he in world war ii 
like, okay, no. Um, and then it's, oh, the guy from Hamilton. We love that guy. He's like my favorite character in Hamilton. So the, I, I do love Hamilton for that reason, because I get a lot of uh, sort of delight when I tell, when I would tell people I was writing a book on Lafayette. Um, in, <laughs> this is a, in France. So I would go to, I would go to like these archives and I would go to these, um, these like libraries and I would say, I'm an American. I'm here researching a book about uh, like the, and I would say like, I'm, it's about the French revolution and the revolution of 1830. And they're like, oh yeah, what's it about? And I'm like, oh, I'm writing a biography of, of Lafayette. And they're like, oh, well, you're an American. Of course you are. Right. Like, <laughs> like they are the, to the extent that they know this happened, like this happened two or three different times of them giving me this, like, oh, well, another American here to write about Lafayette. Because that's the extent I think that they are aware of him is that they know that Americans love Lafayette because they're, they are aware that Lafayette was involved in the American Revolution. And so Americans have this very particular view of him, um, this very particular positive view. In their minds, he's kind of a, a, a quasi famous non entity, um, yeah. where he just, they don't feel like he had that big of an impact. And compared to people like, Mirabeau or Danton or Robespierre or Napoleon like he like in their minds he just doesn't hold a candle to these people he was really extremely second rate being surrounded by people who were much more talented much better than him much smarter than him much more ruthless than he was because Lafayette did not have the killer instinct that those guys had and I think that is both a reason why he failed more as much as he succeeded and also just kind of speaks well of him as a human being he didn't have that ability to just like Garrett people and stab them in the back the way that truly great politicians kind of need to have an instinct like that. Um, but going when you get into sort of the arguments about the the historiography of the French Revolution and, and you do start to have like the socialists and the communists picking it up and a materialist conception of history that starts telling a story of the French Revolution versus conservatives and traditional monarchists and traditional Catholics who are arguing against the French Revolution. Lafayette becomes homeless in the debates about the history of the French Revolution that go on for the rest of the 19th century and then on through the 20th century. And there's really, there's no political faction that exists right now in France that wants to claim him, right? All, everybody's like, yeah, we didn't, you know, the conservatives say he helped overthrow the king and uh, people on the left say, you know, he didn't go far enough and he was, you know, he, he was just a lightweight who got overthrown by Robespierre, who we'd really much rather talk about. So he doesn't really have any sort of uh, stable base of political support in these arguments about the French Revolution, which arguments about the French Revolution have helped define French politics for 200 years. Like you need to, you, bet, you practically need to have a position on who are the good guys and who are the bad guys in the French Revolution so that we can figure out where you fit into contemporary French politics. And if you don't have that, if you don't have somebody out there defending you, then you just become lost in the shuffle. And I think that's what happened to him. Um, with that, let's get to some questions. We have a ton here and um, a lot of really good ones. Okay. So, let her yeah. rip. I'm, I'm not do even, it. I'm not, I don't even see what they are. So, we're just going to do this uh, lightning round style. Okay. So, uh, Russell uh, asked, and I, I like this question quite a bit. It's very straightforward. Why Lafayette instead of Talleyrand? Oh, why Lafayette instead of Talleyrand? Well, if you're going to go to an American publisher, and you're going to try to talk them into letting you write a book about a major figure in the French Revolution, it is a slightly easier sell uh, to get Lafayette on the map uh, than it is to get Talleyrand on the map. Um, so that's, I think, a little bit of it. Um, and then also, uh, it was just sort of where I was mentally in the moment that the storm before the storm ended, uh, or the storm before the storm came out, and I had to start thinking about what I wanted my second book to be. And I did like the fact that Lafayette really tied so much of the revolution's podcast together from the American revolution to the Spanish American independence movements to the Haitian revolution. Like he was everywhere. Talleyrand is this, like, I will probably write a book about Talleyrand at some point. Um, but, you know, Talleyrand is a, is a major figure in French politics and European politics. Lafayette covers everything and he's everywhere and is a symbol to sort of everything I had been talking about for years. And I was going to then get to go back and re-talk about everything, not just like this kind of specific French stuff. Uh, we'll get to Talleyrand. <laughs> 
Uh, Gray asks, uh, how do you see events going differently if Lafayette wasn't there? There, I think, meaning the United States. If his ship sank on his first voyage to America and he never arrived, um, what, you know, what goes down? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. So, like, the thing of he plays a pretty important role in the linkage between France and the United States. Okay, so absent Lafayette, if his ship sinks, do I think that probably France does still back the United States? I do kind of think that that would happen, right? Because the supply ships were still running. Um, you know, the, the, the French arms that were, uh, uh, that made it to the Atlantic coast and got hustled up to, to Gates's armies when they went and fought Burgoyne at Saratoga, right? Like that happened. They won, you know, Lafayette didn't have anything to do with Saratoga. He didn't have anything to do like Ben Franklin did with actually securing the final treaty. So I think that in that sense, it might not have changed that much, but he made that transition and that linkage much, much smoother, right? Because he's sitting right at George Washington's right hand. And George Washington was very suspicious of the French and he was very suspicious of French officers uh, and very suspicious of European officers in general. And the fact that he had Lafayette sort of right there with a direct line to the king and queen and the foreign minister, you know, he's not somebody who was just another one of these uh, adventurous mercenaries coming over to try to fight for the Continental Army. Like, he knows Queen Marie Antoinette personally. He knows Louis the Sixteenth personally. He knows Vergen personally. He's from one of the most important families in France. And then when he goes back to France, he's able to do all of that in reverse. They're talking to him and he's like, yo, George Washington is like my dad, right? I live with him <laughs> in a cabin, right? We are, we are on the best of terms. And I think it did help convince the French government that we can give this aid material and troops to help these continentals because we know that we have somebody we can trust inside the inner circle of American decision making. And so he he's bouncing back and forth between really, truly the inner circles of um, of power in, in the in the Continental Army and in the Second Continental Congress and then back in Versailles. So he helps facilitate that relationship and make it much, much smoother. So if he dies, if, the, if his ship sinks, like maybe it all happens, but I don't know, maybe, maybe the thing just breaks down from mutual suspicion and hostility. And maybe, you know, after the first round of, um, uh, of campaigns don't go so well, maybe the French are like, well, screw it. We don't really care that much. Um, you know, like I could see that happening. Uh, Madeline asks, uh, says and asks, obviously the scope of revolutions is massive across different times and places, but, uh, but then there are pieces like Lafayette that tie together so many chronological, thematic, and ideological strains. In that sense, to you, is Revolutions 10 individual series or is it a single continuous thing? Oh, like that's a good life? question. Yeah. Great question. Yeah. Um, one continuous thing. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think that th this happened to me when it was really when I did the Haitian Revolution series, um, which kind of hit like just changed me from like so many different angles and ways. But one of the things that it did was made me realize just how much everything that was happening in the Atlantic world through this period and all of these revolutionary events was just kind of one ongoing continuous event. And that I became very detached from the idea that you can tell uh, uh, segmented national histories right? That you can tell the history of France without talking about the international scene. You can, that we should talk about the United States without talking about what was happening in the Caribbean or South America or Europe or Africa. Like you, these, everybody is situated in an international context. And then when you go back and you read their correspondence, you recognize that they were living in an international context. None of them were living in a national context, right? Everybody had correspondence in France and in Italy and in uh, South America. They were, you know, you, you've got trade missionaries rooming around, you've got uh, trade routes, you've got armies marching, you know, hither and yon, you've got, you know, the slave networks uh, that are tying all of this together. And so it became very clear to me that when we talk about stuff that is happening in a single isolated unit, um, it's because of the things that preceded it, it then influences the things that come after it, and it is situated inside a larger geographic context that it just becomes one inextricably linked ball that is rolling downhill, you know, towards like the present day. <laughs> and then 
I did it, you know, I did a, a thing in uh, the revolutions of 1848 is I think when I wrote this episode, um, there was the specter of the French revolution that is about how all of these people in 1848 um, who are running around doing things are doing so in the near aftermath of the French revolution. And they were all referencing the French revolution and had the, had their preferred version of the French revolution. And so everybody, and that, and then that kind of thing is going to carry forward all the way to Russia, you know, Lenin and those guys are reading, they, they are so well-versed in the, in the French revolution um, that, yeah, all of this stuff is just one giant thing that is interconnected. There is no such thing as uh, atomized historical events. Everything is a web connected to everything else. Yeah, no. It, just to just to add to that, there's, I mean, there's a whole um, field of history called Atlantic history, which is basically mm -hmm. uh, attempting to to connect the histories of the United States, the Caribbean, uh, South America. It's sort of seeing all of this as one kind of unified thing. And I know my engagement with that field has been incredibly fruitful because I do think it kind of fundamentally changes your perspective on the events on these personalities when you begin to recognize that yeah they weren't they weren't as provincial as we think they were exactly that's i mean that's the thing is like this is not something that we are projecting in retrospect onto them this is something that they organically were involved in an international atlantic context that we moved away from i because we got into parochial national history that was not actually accurately portraying uh, the situation at the time. And I'm, you know, like, and, and like I said, once I got through with Haiti and realized how interconnected all of this stuff was truly, 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 um, I'm a huge proponent of Atlantic history as a, as how we should be properly conceiving of the history of this period. Um, okay. So Elizabeth uh, asked, uh, I just lost a question. There we go. Lafayette struggled with diplomacy when uh, mediating between the Royalists and the Revolutionaries in the French Revolution of 1789. What lessons do you think he learned that we could apply today? And there's a second question here. Also, if my husband went to prison, I wouldn't move myself and the kids all into prison with him. Uh, Am that's I a fine. Bad wife? That's fair. That's totally fair. <laughs> <laughs> um, Adrien was devoted and loyal and had been separated from her husband enough. And, uh, but yeah, darling, if you're out there and you go to prison, <laughs> I'll probably just try to watch the kids until you get out. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to come join you. And I hope that you would do the same. Like if you guys are still, anyway, if the kids are still watching, hi Elliot, hi Olive. Um, but uh, to the other question, like what's a good lesson? Okay, so one of the things that I did try to get to in the book is Lafayette had, I think a, a misconception of how to do politics in the sense that he believed all of these sort of stories that in a virtuous republic, uh, individuals come together and as individuals weigh the pros and cons of an issue and then decide, you know, sort of disinterestedly what they should do. And if every, if every individual comes together and behaves in that way, then that's how we should do politics. And what his great failing as a politician was that he didn't recognize that it was good to have allies and good to organize with other people who share your beliefs and want to get something done that political parties are not just they're not a bad thing you know like when you when you just sort of look at them uh in the context of how do we actually achieve the things that we want to achieve um he heard all this stuff from Thomas Jefferson and from George Washington about how bad it was to have political parties. But as I said in the book, like he was, he listened to all this and believed it. They said all of this stuff and then set about organizing the first political parties in American history and ran very efficient political machines, actually, uh, that Lafayette simply didn't ever get into. And he always stood aloof from people who tried to make alliances with him. Uh, because he thought he was doing politics in a virtuous way, but really what he was doing, <clears throat> excuse me, is just is weakening his own ability to pursue the things that he believed in and stopping from being enacted things that he did not believe in, because that's also important. Um, so that's, I think that's a good lesson to learn is that organizing a group of people who are like-minded and want to achieve something together, that's not a bad thing. And it's in fact, actually how you do democratic politics. 
It's interesting to think that maybe the difference between the, maybe the, besides youth, maybe the one reason Lafayette heard, you know, Washington and Jefferson, et cetera, complaining about factions and took it to heart, whereas they kind of very obviously kind of disregarded all of this is because they actually had this very immediate experience of actually having to work in a government, right? Like Lafayette doesn't have that experience at that, that, that quickly. He's sort of involved in government. He is, um, uh, a legislator basically, but very quickly, Washington is president, Jefferson is secretary of state. Hamilton is, you know, basically something akin to a chief of staff. Um, all of his friends in the Americas are in executive power and are, are dealing with sort of like the exigencies of executive power in ways that I think become conducive to political organizing. And I'm not sure Lafayette yeah. ever has that experience. Well, I mean, the, the, <clears throat> he's more idealistic than them, I think is, is some of it. And I do think that the knock on him of being a little naive is also true because all around him at that same time, you know, you have things like the Jacobins being organized and the Fouillon being organized. And he tried, he tried to organize a, this club of 1789 um, to sort of combat when to combat the Jacobins when they started to get more and more powerful, but that was trying to bring together disinterested individuals to be disinterestedly individualistic together, <laughs> as opposed to actually trying to like, let's start a party newspaper, you know, let's actually, let's organize something. Let's, uh, let's decide what we're going to vote before we actually have the vote, right? Like th those kinds of things. Like if you want to win in democratic politics, that's how you do it. And that Lafayette never quite got there. Um, a question from, I just had it up here. Um, uh, this this re regards the, the podcast. Uh, I know you've said that Russia is the last revolution you'll be covering on the podcast. If you had to pick just one revolution you didn't get into the podcast that you most wish you had, what would it be and why? Uh, well, <clears throat> there's, a, there's a list of things that, you know, if <clears throat> I was just doing revolutions indefinitely, you know, I would have done Cuba. I would have done probably the Iranian revolution. Ultimately, um, I have a very strong suspicion at this point that like the Spanish civil war would have slipped its way in there. Um, and then the other one is that I think really complete would, would complete the, my sort of grand French revolutionary uh, narrative, because I have now done this thing where I've more or less told the story of each of the French revolutions is to do the Algerian war of independence as a sort of a counter to that matches a bit of what like what was going on in Haiti, which is like, this is a revolution against you, as opposed to like, rah, 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 the French, it's like, you know, the French are, you know, they've been occupying this country for 150 years after a publicity stunt that was staged by, you know, Charles X trying to win an election. I gotta um, say that was jaw dropping to me when I read it. Like I, I had, I had no, I, I've seen Battle of Algiers, but I had no sense of like where, when the French occupation began, and the idea that it was basically just sort of like a, a, a wag the dog stunt, yeah, is he, he, is absolutely wild to me. And then they just never left, right? They they did they did it as a campaign stunt to get people excited about voting for the king's candidates, and then they just never left. But anyway, to, to so to the point, like that that's 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 really where we would have gone. Um, oh, and, and Irish, you know, uh, the Irish wars of independence, I think is on that list too, but this all, like you take all of those things, that's five or seven more years worth of work. And there are other things that I'm interested in and other things, other stories that I would like to tell. Um, and so I, eventually I have to disengage from revolutions and I'd rather leave people wanting more than being like, I can't believe this guy is still doing revolutions. Nobody's listened to him in 10 years and he's still <laughs> out there like rambling on about whatever. So ultimately this thing kind of becomes a story bookended by 1789 and 1917. And I think that that's a good, you know, it's a good solid thing to leave behind. I think we have time for one more question. So um, uh, there's a bunch of questions about revolutions you're trying to see, I'm trying to get through. Uh, I want to ask something that is much more, you know, uh, summation, it sums up the conversation a bit more. So how about this? Uh, Toby asked, uh, what do you think gave Lafayette this relentless liberal reformist and revolutionary drive? What, what, what in his personality or in his experiences um, produced that? 
Um, I mean, that's hard to say because a, a bit of it, we just have to rely on this nebulous thing called like his character, um, wherever that comes from. Uh, when you go back through him talking about his childhood, we know that, you know, as a good sort of member of the rustic sword nobility, that his family raised him with stories of the great deeds of his ancestors. You know, this is kind of a, <clears throat> a way that aristocracies do uh, uh, sort of foster the next generation going all the, I mean, this is more or less the same thing that happened with the Romans is you tell these stories of your ancestors that you then want these, this next generation to live up to and to try to emulate and to maybe even outdo um, the people that had come before you. So Lafayette was raised from a young age wanting to make a great mark on the world, right? He wanted to be famous. He wanted to do something glorious. He wanted to achieve something. He had ambition. And I don't, and beyond this sort of being taught to him, some of it I think just comes, that's the way he was born, right? Sometimes people just come out and have personalities. And so he, he's got this drive and ambition, but then it's like, why does it get laced with this particularly idealistic vision? Because you can, you can just be kind of a cutthroat, like Talleyrand was ambitious, you know, and Talleyrand is ambitious in a way that is not, that is actually like cynical and calculating and, um, uh, and not idealistic at all. So where, where and why does Lafayette like hit on these things? And again, I, I think that it just kind of comes down to the, his, his inborn personality where once he starts hearing about these, these noble ideas of liberty and equality, because this is just stuff that's floating around in the atmosphere. Um, he's like, man, it would be, it would be really great to you know, win a battle on behalf of liberty, right? Whatever that whatever that means. Like when he's a teenager, like you know, the way that the way that we watch movies or something and dream of being the hero and saving the day and doing something really, really great. Um, like, well, well, why does he? Why is he like that? <laughs> and I mean, some of it, I guess, the answer is just that's that's the way he came out of the cradle. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Mike, uh, for this great conversation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for doing this. Uh, it's my pleasure. This is a lot of fun. Um, is there anything we else we, we need to do? Um, or do we just sign off? Yeah, that's it. Um, but bit before you go, on the behalf of Politics and Pros, we'd like to thank Mike and Jamel for doing this event with us. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. We also greatly appreciate our audience for attending our events and specifically supporting this one by purchasing a signed copy of Hero of Two Worlds. Thank you. It will be ready for pickup on August 24th. And those of you who selected shipping, it will start shipping from the store on August 24th. Um, and everyone have a good evening. Yep. Yeah, thank you, everybody out there who came. Thank you very, very much. Yes, thank um, you so much for tuning in. Yeah, thanks for doing this. Politics and Pros, thank you for having us. Uh, this was great fun. Have a good night.